I'd like to welcome you to the Molecular Medicine Lecture Series, which has been organized by the Molecular Medicine Program at the University of Washington. And uh, it's partially sponsored by a grant from the Howard Hughes Med Medical Institute. Uh, the Mo Molecular Medicine Training Program started uh, as an idea uh, generated by two professors in the School of Medicine, Nancy Maisels and Stan McKnight, who uh, felt that the time was right for a program that would facilitate dialogue uh, between students whose primary focus was in the basic sciences and uh, people who were interested in the clinical sciences. And although those two spheres of endeavor interact to a great degree. We thought it would be useful for, uh, for to generate a greater, greater grasp of the dialogue, a greater degree of comfort in communication. As part of that program, we started a course in molecular medicine to highlight some of the, those kinds of interactions and found this to be a very exciting experience and we'd like to share some of that excitement with a broader audience, uh, namely you. And in discussing the kinds of things that might be valuable to talk about, we focused on issues that were important problems in uh, biomedical science, that some of which at first glance might be very susceptible to straightforward solution, but have proven themselves refractory. Among those is uh, the infectious disease known as malaria. Uh, it's a disease that has been with us since prehistory. It's been so prominent in our history that it's probably affected aspects of human evolution in areas where, where the disease is prominent. It was present in North America when the colonists came, and the vector that could transmit the disease is still around with us now, even though we haven't much malaria. The featured speaker for tonight is uh, Dr. Wesley Van Voris, who is in the Department of Medicine and is currently acting as the division head in infectious diseases and allergy. Uh, Wes is one of those people who seems to do everything very well. And he manages to do that with uh, a warm, affable, and kind demeanor. Um, he trained at MIT got his medical training at Cornell and the Rockefeller University where he obtained his PhD, did his house staff training at University of California, San Francisco, and then came here to begin his infectious disease fellowship. He's been with us since where he has made huge contributions to the areas of infectious diseases that excite him most, which are the parasitic diseases that are so prevalent in what was once called the third world, but I think that since this is really one world now, it's, it's all of us. Um, Wes has contributed by um, really establishing and developing the Tropical Medicine Clinic at the university. He has taught extensively, and his research program has contributed substantially to his goals of advancing our understanding of these parasitic diseases and ways to discover therapies for them. Wes. Well, thank you, Henry. That was a wonderful introduction, and I'm sure I'm not deserving of it, but I'm happy to take it. Uh, and, and thank you all for coming out for on such a miserable night that even a malaria mosquito probably wouldn't uh, come out on. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really excited to introduce the idea of, of malaria to you that are, some of you 
have not really even thought about this disease much other than reading about it in the, in the newspapers. Others of you that are sitting in the audience I can see are my esteemed colleagues who I, I find the University of Washington a really warm and wonderful environment to collaborate with. And I think it makes our institution one of the very best uh, in the United States. So well, first of all, to introduce you to this slide, uh, malaria, hot times for a bad disease. The reason I titled it hot times for a bad disease is not so much that you get fever from it, which is absolutely the case, but rather that there's lots going on now in global health and there's lots to be excited about. You probably know about all the jazz, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gets every time they describe a new uh, and emerging uh, grant that they're making. They're certainly involved with malaria and a lot of other things. And we have now the malaria genome, you know, the genetic code that actually describes what the, uh, what the makeup of malaria is. And it's also a time where breakthroughs are actually causing a difference out in the field in people's health and so on. So, so this, this picture actually, uh, I'm going to try pointing with this little pointer. Can you all see that? This woman is sitting by the fire because she's, she's chilled uh, with malaria. This is a woodcut from the uh, 19th century showing the effects of malaria. So this woman's chilled and this, she's in the clutches of the parasite. Malaria is a single cell parasite. Fortunately, it's not quite that big, but you know, it shows it wrapped around her and she's chilled and she's about to get attacked by this guy, which is a so-called egg monster, which is the guy that's gonna make her real feverish and hot and move away from that fire. Uh, meanwhile, her husband's doing his work over here, ignoring the whole scene, so nothing's really changed over time. But, uh, and then these are the malaria parasites shown as tiny intracellular parasites that, that you may have seen in the demonstration out front. So malaria affects about a half a billion people a year. So I want to start out with one story about a child with malaria, one, one of half a billion stories that happens every single year. A three-year-old Kenyan boy from Africa, obviously, feels bad, has chills, but is warm to the touch. And later, he becomes increasingly sleepy, and his mother starts to get concerned about her, and she can't actually wake him up. So she brings him to the local medical clinic, and he's unarousable there. They, they can't wake him up, and he's got very high fever. And they probably reason without any lab tests, like some of the tests you were shown outside, that, that he has malaria. And so they have to put in an intravenous line to deliver the uh, the malaria medicine. And the diagnosis of this is something called cerebral malaria. The malaria has gotten to his brain to such a bad state that he actually is unarousable, can't wake up. So malaria is a, a mosquito-borne parasite. So it's transmitted by the anopheline mosquitoes. This is a so-called vector of disease, right? So something like a mosquito can fly from person to person transmitting a disease. So we call it a vector. And it, it makes about, I mentioned, up to half a billion in recent surveys have, have thought to be infected uh, by malaria every single year. Although these numbers are actually exceedingly difficult to get because they're happening at the ends of roads where people are out in rural areas uh, experiencing mosquito bites and getting malaria transmitted. The recent surveys, uh, one particularly by Snow and his colleagues, have suggested that uh, between 1.7 and 2.5 million people die of malaria every year. This is just intolerable. And they're mostly, this is happening in one to five year old children. This is because this is when their immune system is the most susceptible to malaria. And because the, uh, malaria remains a huge problem in Africa in particular. In fact, I like this picture of the malaria mosquito, the Anopheline mosquito with showing the shadow cast upon uh, Africa there. Uh, and that's to show you what a shadow malaria actually casts upon sub-Saharan Africa. So how can you conceive of two million children dying a year? It's really hard. I mean, I like to try and break it down into lower numbers. So for instance, here's an African daycare shown down here in the, in the right lower uh, uh, part of the slide. 
And there's 12 children in that daycare center. And 450 of these daycare centers would just go out of existence every single day uh, from the deaths that are occurring. Or an easier way to think about it is one child dying every 20 seconds. So during this talk uh, uh, of about an hour, uh, we're going to see something like 180 deaths of, of malaria, unfortunately. So the other really susceptible population besides the one to five year old children turn out to be pregnant women, and particularly pregnant women that are in their first pregnancy. And I'll talk to you about work that's being done that's, that's led to an understanding about this and how this is a new promising area for a vaccine to prevent malaria, particularly in that population. So in this talk, I'll talk to you first a little bit about the disease, then uh, the disease, and I've talked a little bit about the epidemiology. I'll move to talking about how malaria causes illness, and some of these things we've just worked out, in fact, since we've gotten the genome of malaria, we've worked this out. I'll move to uh, what are sort of new promising areas in intervention, and some of the the recent uh, uh, good news that's been uh, released uh, about uh, malaria, our, our efforts having an impact on reducing the malaria around the world, and I'll talk to you about new efforts that are needed to help eradicate the disease. So the, the word malaria actually comes from Italian, from mala aria, meaning bad air. And originally, folks thought that when you lived around swamps, the air actually bubbled up and caused people to have the symptoms of malaria. It wasn't until uh, in 1880 that Lavaran uh, uh, discovered malaria parasites are actually intracellular parasites. They're single-celled parasites that occur in red blood cells. He found this in Algeria in the F French Foreign Legion in 1880. Uh, so lots of good things came out of the French Foreign Legion, other than the old movies that we see. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1907 for this discovery. Then uh, uh, Sir uh, Ronald Ross uh, discovered malaria parasites in the Anopheline mosquitoes. There had been some suspicion that malaria was somehow connected to mosquitoes, but, but Ross actually painstakingly dissected mosquitoes, as you did out front, and found the malaria parasites in them. He did this in India in a, in a town now called Secunderabad uh, in 1887, and he won the Nobel Prize actually before Lavaran uh, for this finding. So this led to some important you know, public health considerations because we knew if we could keep mosquitoes away from people, we could stop the transmission of this infectious diseases, uh, this infectious disease. Uh, unfortunately, Malaria has continued to be a problem, and this didn't solve the public health problem. So I mentioned before, malaria is a parasite. It's actually a single cell parasite. We call that a protozoan pathogen, as to be uh, uh, dis distinguished from bacteria, which are single celled, but don't have a nucleus. And uh, it, the kinds of illness that malaria cause, I mentioned fever and chills are a big part. So remember the lady, close to the fire trying to get warm. It also causes cerebral malaria. I've told you about one story where a child came to medical help because that child had cerebral malaria. And I'll tell you a little bit about what happens to cause cerebral malaria a little bit later. It can cause anemia. Now anemia sounds like a big term, but it's really just when the red blood cell counts, the red blood cells get so low in the body that you don't have enough red cells to carry around oxygen. And this child's actually having his eyelids pulled back. Normally somebody's eyelids should be really pink, but if you have good eyes, you can pick up that this child's eyelids are very pink, are very white underneath. And this is a sign he has profound anemia. He may also have signs of heart failure because the oxygen isn't getting around enough in his body. Uh, then the, the next, thing that happens, or another thing that happens, is the spleen enlarges. Now, the spleen is an organ that's right here next to the stomach uh, in the body. It's blown up here for you, and the spleen is actually a filter of blood. So if you think about it, all these malaria-infected red cells are getting filtered out in the spleen. As that happens, it enlarges, and uh, 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 people 
uh, actually can have the spleen rupture or other things happen because of that. I already mentioned that malaria is much more severe in pregnancy. It can cause loss of the baby, that is fetal loss, and it can also kill the mother, uh, particularly in the first and, and even more commonly in the second pregnancies than say in the third and beyond. And then the uh, other kinds of symptoms it can cause, it can cause enough damage to the lungs to, to make someone breathless. Uh, it can cause uh, damage to the kidneys that help us urinate and secrete water, and it can cause damage to the liver, uh, which helps remove toxins from our body. So how are you going to remember these parts of the illness? Well, let me sing you a little song, and I'm going to do it at my peril because I've just stopped being hoarse from laryngitis. So, Malaria, I just got a chill from malaria, and suddenly I knew a fever would come to and sweat. Malaria, I think I shall die from malaria. My breath is laboring on, my consciousness is gone, I'm pale malaria. Sing it soft and you'll hear skeeters whining. Sing it loud and your spleen will be pining. Malaria, 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 malaria. Thank you. Thank you. It's lucky I'm in science. Okay. So, okay, that'll help you remember the, the illness of malaria. Let's talk about some more about malaria to help understand it. It has a really fascinating life cycle that involves both the mosquito and the human. And somebody asked me earlier, where did malaria come from before humans? It turns out that the mosquitoes and other kinds of animals have malaria cycles too. They don't go into humans, but for instance, there's a chicken malaria, there's a lizard malaria, and so on. Luckily, we can't get all of those malarias. But with the mosquito shown here, the mosquito releases these pencil-like uh, sporozoites when it bites. And those go into the bloodstream and find their way into liver cells. And it can sit there for a period of a week or so, or even for months to sometimes years, then rupture out of the liver cell. Interestingly, not many liver cells are infected, so that's not what causes liver damage. People are generally asymptomatic during that time. They don't have any problems with malaria. When they come out and go into the red cells, that's when you really get sick. So, the, these, these uh, parasites come out of the liver cells, uh, invade red blood cells, go inside the red cells, and then go through these remarkable changes, rupture open the red cell after it's proliferated to 16 to 32 different uh, uh, units, and then each of those can affect another red cell. And this happens over a period of 36 to 72 hours. So uh, the numbers that can go up in your body very, happen actually very quickly. So you can see, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of your red cells infected very quickly. Some percentage of the time, the malaria parasites shift into these, these stages, which are gametocytes. You could think of them as sort of sperm and egg of the malaria. And what they're hoping is that another mosquito will come along and feed on you and suck up that gametocyte. And then that'll, that'll go inside the, the mosquito, as is shown in this cross-section of this lovely mosquito. The male and female gametocytes come out and have sex there. So it's a, you know, the, the mosquitoes are actually a, a veritable brothel uh, with the sexual cycle going on. And do you guys know what sex is for? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought you would think that. Well, the, actually, sex is for to reassort genes, right? So you can have genes come together and give you the fittest of the species. So all these sexual, the sexual cycle of the malaria is coming to reassort genes and give malaria the best chance of going uh, through its life cycle. And uh, so, so things might happen, like a drug resistance gene might come together with 
a gene that would make it survive better in another person, and then you'd have drug resistance malaria getting transmitted from one person to another. So it undergoes this complex life cycle where you have these sperm-like elements coming out and invading the egg. Sounds a little bit like what happens in us, right? But then it plows through the gut here, moves into the foregut of the, of the mosquito, and then these, in actually the salivary glands, these little units come out called sporozoites, and they're injected back into humans uh, during the next feeding cycle of the anopheline female, so the female uh, mosquito. And uh, if you've ever been out with a bunch of tropical medicine guys, it's really fun because I go to tropical medicine meetings and the guys, you know, watch the mosquitoes on them and go, ooh, that one's an anopheline female. Can you see how it sticks its butt up in the air? And the other one goes, no, that's an Aedes. It's sitting flat. But, you know, it's kind of, but mosquitoes are really cool organisms. They have this advanced hypodermic engineering that they created a long time before we even had engineers where they have this, this unit that slides back as they push their jaws in, under the skin. And when their jaws come in, they cut into the skin and find uh, a, a capillary bed or whatever, uh, by hook or by crook, so to speak, no pun intended. And they shoot a, 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 a bunch of salivary juice down into your skin. And this salivary juice actually is an anticoagulant. It stops blood from clotting. It would be a miserable deal, right, if, if the mosquito got the blood halfway up its little proboscis and then it clotted. So it shoots in this anticoagulant, allows it to take up the blood, but in shooting in that anticoagulant, it, if it has been infected with malaria, it'll shoot in malaria sporozoites and that'll infect the human. So it's, a, it's an amazing uh, process that led to this infectious cycle with malaria. Now, uh, malaria uh, red blood cell forms, as I mentioned earlier, are the really the ones that cause disease. And uh, with the rupture of the red blood cells, as is shown in this part of the, of the diagram here where the little parasites are being released, the insides of the red cells are released. And when they're released, there's toxin release. And that toxin actually triggers our own white cells to know something's up. And the white cells send out a signal saying, make a fever. So that's why we end up with the fevers that happen uh, over and over, actually, in malaria because of the rupture of red cells. Why, why does malaria cause such sickness? Why does it cause things like cerebral malaria, like in that little child I told you about from Kenya? Well, one of the reasons is, is that the infected red blood cells, the red blood cells that have the parasites inside, stick to the blood vessels. And by sticking all over in the blood vessels, they actually can kind of gum up the blood vessels in various organs. When they gum up the blood vessels here, if they're stuck in the capillaries in the brain, the little tiny blood vessels, the oxygen isn't getting through to the brain properly, and you can have the phenomena called cerebral malaria, where the child isn't getting enough blood to his brain, and uh, actually that's uh, causing some of the disease. Then, uh, I mentioned that pregnant women are more likely to get uh, uh, seriously infected with malaria, and part of that is because their placenta, that is the unit that transfers oxygen from the woman to the baby, actually gets gummed up with malaria parasites too. And those parasites can proliferate to such high numbers that it can kill the infant and it can kill the mother. So this is a picture of the placenta and a high-powered view showing the gummed up, infected malaria, red blood cells stuck all over. And this can happen anywhere out into the vasculature. Um, in fact, probably what the malaria, we don't want to try and second guess what the malaria bug is thinking, partly because it can't think, but uh, probably what it's trying to do or what's been evolutionarily selected, right, is for the parasites to stick out in the vasculature and not go through the spleen. So I already told you, the spleen is the blood filter. You don't want to go through the spleen because there you're going to get eaten and destroyed. So this keeps the malaria out in the periphery, but it causes bad effects for the humans. Now, how does it do that? How does it actually stick out? Well, the key to the response was Velcro before Velcro was ever discovered, right? Because what happens is, 
the malaria parasite encodes for proteins, that is, uh, uh, you know, proteins that are exported out into the red blood cell membrane. So shown here, comes out of the parasite, makes it out to the surface of the red blood cell, and then, like the little hooks on Velcro, sticks out onto the blood vessel lining, as is shown here. Well, the interesting thing is that, or one interesting thing is that it's not just one gene that does this, but it's literally hundreds of genes. So I mentioned that this, the malaria proteins, the reason for the Velcro sticking and sticking out in the periphery, when we got the genome, that is the collection of genes that make up the malaria genome, when it was all sequenced, you know, like the human genome was sequenced, we got the malaria genome sequenced. It turns out there's hundreds of genes for these, these proteins that are exported out into the red blood cell. And the interesting thing is that although there are hundreds, uh, the malaria parasite only shows them one at a time. So that, that allows them to show them for a while and then change their code and show another one. And this helps malaria persist. So the immune response is always trying to play catch up. So like, like uh, Janie here who's wearing a red sweater one day, the next day she takes off that red sweater and puts on a green sweater. The next day she takes off the green sweater and puts on a purple sweater. The malaria parasite is changing its outer surface coat, its sweater if you will, to be able to, to outrun the immune system. And it can almost do this indefinitely. It has hundreds of these genes that it can show one at a time. This little scary looking graph down here shows numbers of parasites in the blood and then the different colors are to show you different genes that are being expressed for this surface protein. And this is a phenomenon we call antigenic variation where there's one protein of a color shown at a time, the immune system knocks that down, another one emerges at a later time, then the immune system knocks that down and so on. This process allows persistence of the malaria parasite and helps it actually stay in the body for long periods of time, at least until we can take some medicine or for our immune system finally to, to recognize several hundred different of, of these things and, and keep it at bay. So this, one more point about this is people ask, well, why are children at one to five year olds of, especially, of a special risk? Well, it turns out during that period of, of being one to five year olds, two things have been shown to correlate to getting more resistant. It's not like you don't get sick after you're five, but your chances of dying are less and you get malaria less and less frequently. And so the two things that happen are number one, you start to recognize sporozoites, so the parts that come from the mosquito, the little tubular forms, you start to recognize them as foreign. And number two, you start to recognize a wide variety, all the different colors, if you will, and shades of gray of these, of these different proteins. It's not perfect, so people still get sick even when they're you know, beyond five years old, actually, but it helps a lot. So this, this may explain also, this probably does explain why someone like me goes into a malarious area, there's no one really sick there, and I come down with malaria if I'm not taking some medicine to prevent it from happening. Because I haven't really been exposed to all that immune training to try and get a natural uh, resistance to malaria going. So I want to talk to you about some promising areas of malaria research. First of all, in prevention, there's exciting things coming up in mosquito control. There's new drugs, and, and we at the university are a large part of that. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues here tonight work with me on, on, on trying to develop new drugs. And there are some new drugs that are actually coming out of old drugs that are of great promise too. And then I'll also talk to you about some of the scientific advances in vaccine technology, some of which have occurred here and at Seattle Biomedical Research Institute. So first, let me talk a little bit about uh, tools for mosquito control that have gotten better in Africa. Uh, first of all, uh, people are using insecticide-treated bed nets. These are nets you put over the bed to prevent the mosquitoes from getting in. It turns out they do have to be dipped in, in insecticides at fairly regular intervals, although a recent technology breakthrough has gotten them to the point where probably they're active for seven or so years till they need to be redipped as is shown in this uh, picture. Uh, 
Indoor residual spraying with DDT is actually coming back and we're trying to re-educate the public about uh, uh, the use of DDT and how terrific it is for spraying the inside of houses. We don't need to spray it willy-nilly all over crops and cause what Rachel Carcel was uh, worried about in Silent Spring, but actually uh, uh, re-employing DDT makes a lot of sense at, at this point. Then there are advanced uh, repellents and larval control under, under uh, development. And finally, a number of groups are working around the country at actually genetically altering mosquitoes. So we now have the mosquito genome, and they, they've found ways to actually make mosquitoes resistant to infection by malaria. So they're, they're studying now about uh, deployment of genetically altered mosquitoes. Um, but the, the simplest intervention, that is insecticide-treated nets, has really been shown to make a remarkable difference. There have been more than 20 randomized trials where they've given nets to half the village and not to the other, or to one village and not the other, and they've shown over a 50% reduction in uncomplicated malaria, that is malaria where you just get a fever or something, and over a, a greater than 40% reduction in severe malaria and deaths in these trials. Um, and this has been shown to be one of the most cost-effective interventions in public health. So that means you don't have to pay many dollars to actually save a lot of lives. And uh, I want to highlight that UW's uh, Dr. Paula Brentlinger is uh, very active in implementation in, in Africa in this. Uh, and this has shown uh, a distribution center where they're distributing bed nets to, to folks. An, an, an issue in malaria actually has been that the drugs that we have to cure it, the malaria has found ways to become drug resistant to it. And this, this world's map, which shows the areas where malaria is still widely transmitted in red shows both green and blue dots. The blue dots are where there's resistance to the classical drug for malaria, chloroquine, that's been in heavy use since World War II. A very, very cheap and effective anti-malarial until it's basically been wiped out in terms of usefulness by resistance around the world. The other dot is a more recent phenomena that is uh, sulfadoxine pyrimethine resistance, uh, which is another drug that's used widely around the world. And as you can see, resistance is spreading willy-nilly to that. And not only these drugs, but drugs that have been fairly recently developed, there's new resistance to malaria, and they're spreading around the world. One of the, the interesting new breakthroughs is for a, a class of drugs called artemisinin-based drugs. And these are based on a classical Chinese therapy for malaria known since about 200 BC to abate fevers, that is, probably treat things like malaria. And uh, a Chinese uh, uh, scientist, that is, uh, Tu Yo-Yo, act isolated active uh, anti-malarial, that is, uh, King Haoshu. From uh, or artemisinin from the plant in 1972. And, and this is the chemical structure, and this is the actual plant. This plant grows all over the place, basically like weeds, and uh, has been uh, planted all over the world now to try and isolate this natural substance. The, uh, one of the breakthroughs, though, has been to combine this artemisinin, this uh, Chinese uh, uh, plant derived chemical uh, with other drugs. And this helps us by adding efficacy in eliminating parasites from the drug. So with two drugs, you're more likely to wipe out all the parasites. And there's also less chance of emergence. So if you think about it, if, if you have uh, uh, 100 million parasites in your blood, and it's actually a fairly good chance, if you're sick with malaria, you'll have 100 to 100 million to a billion parasites in your blood. Probably one in a million of those parasites will be resistant to any one particular drug that you take. So if you uh, just take one drug, there's a good chance that you'll have problems with emergence of drug resistance. But if you take two drugs, that means it's a million times a million. So that makes it a very small chance that any one person will have emergence of drug resistance. Unfortunately, when you add this up all over the world, though, there's still 
reasonable chance is that worldwide we'll have emergence of resistance. And, uh, but nonetheless, this artemisinin combination therapy has emerged as the drug of choice. It's recommended by the WHO, certainly by, in Africa and in Southeast Asia, but they're promulgating this as the therapy of choice around the world. So there's new hope, actually, for malaria based on some of these simple interventions. So first of all, using insecticide-treated bed nets plus artemisinin and combination therapy, the therapy I was talking to you about a moment. Uh, last week, reported in the New York Times, my, one of my favorite science journals, and maybe yours, uh, as well as the Seattle Times, that this intervention has been shown for the first time in, in literally uh, 45 years to actually reduce the overall morbidity and mortality of malaria. And, and the, the results actually are phenomenal where they've rolled this out in African countries. So in Ethiopia, they saw a 50% reduction in deaths. Uh, in Zambia, they saw about a third reduction in deaths and they actually didn't have as good a rollout uh, uh, in Zambia, so they're feeling they can do a lot better there. And in Rwanda, they had a 60% reduction in death. So this is really great and new hope. My presentation to you two weeks ago would have shown how the number of malaria deaths just keep going up and up despite the world trying to uh, intervene on this. And you may have heard about uh, back in, uh, at the end of 2007 that there was a big malaria conference in, in Seattle uh, brought together by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And at that uh, conference, actually, Melinda Gates stood up and, and made the call that we should do the right thing and eradicate malaria. And, uh, I think a lot of the scientists were feeling a little queasy about that because eradicate is a big word that's hard to do. But then the, the, uh, uh, the uh, general of the uh, World Health Organization stood up and said, this is the right thing to do. And anybody that challenges that it isn't uh, is, is basically in a lot of trouble. So I don't think there was a lot of uh, quibbling after that. But we, to, to be able to eradicate malaria uh, most experts feel we still need new tools. We're likely to see resistance to this new class of drugs, the artemisinin drugs, and uh, to be able to find out if resistance is happening and react to it in a timely manner, we need to establish networks to track drug resistance. And I'll tell you in a second about uh, one of our faculty members' uh, uh, work on that. And we need to desperately need to find new and backup drugs both to combine with artemisinin and to put a separate uh, therapy so that we can, we can deal with the resistance as it emerges. And then the other thing that comes along with eradication or elimination is vaccines. And I'll talk to you about the uh, vaccines that are coming down the pike. So this is a slide uh, uh, given to me by Carol Sibley that shows a, uh, a new group of, of scientists around the world that she's helped organize called WARN, or World Anti-Malarial Resistance Network. And uh, uh, Carol's sitting up here in the, in the auditorium. She can tell you more about this. You may notice that there's a lot of dots around Africa and uh, around uh, uh, South America and Asia and so on. But then why do you think there's dots out here in, in the United States where we don't have malaria transmitted or in Europe? Or... Well, it's because people fly from malarious areas to those places. We have that happen in Seattle a few dozen times a year. People will fly here. They'll come down with a brutal case of malaria. We'll be able to isolate their parasites, figure out where they've been, and then actually by figuring out, you know, what their parasites are resistant to, that tells us a lot about what's happening in some of the undeveloped areas of the world where they might have acquired that. So it's a very useful exercise to not only collect it in areas where malaria transmission is going on, but to use the sentinel canaries, those wonderful travelers who refuse to take their anti-malarial medicine before they go and, or while they're there, and then they come back sick with, sick with malaria and we figure out that it's resistant. Actually, some of the time people do take their medicine and they get malaria anyway. So we really need to study those people because they, they, they might have resistant malaria. 
So what is it, how can we make new drugs uh, to malaria? Well, uh, one way is to take drugs or all kinds of chemicals and expose them to the whole organism. And another way is to look for a drug target. Uh, so that is a drug, an enzyme or a cellular component of the malaria parasite and the drug can bind to that enzyme or cellular component like a lock and key, basically locking up that, that, uh, uh, that uh, parasite's enzyme so it can't function normally and then the parasite dies. So the, uh, that's shown here in this three-dimensional structure created by Christoph Verlin uh, where the malaria drug is modeled in here as these red dots locking up the uh, enzyme uh, like a lock and a key. And we're working together to try and identify new drug targets uh, to uh, find drugs for this. So what, you know, this sounds fairly simple. Why can't we just create new anti-malarial drugs? Why can't drug companies do it? Well, one problem is, is that drug companies really don't have much incentive. Pharmaceutical companies want to earn about 100 million a year or better for their new discovery. And uh, the market in developing countries uh, is very limited. Probably the annual health expenditure, well, the annual health expenditure in most developing countries where malaria is a big problem is less than five US dollars uh, per year. Actually, maybe since the US dollar sunk a lot, maybe it's more like less than eight, but anyway. Uh, and then the travelers and the military market is fairly limited. So this means that they don't have much incentive to go into drug development for malaria. However, much of the drug development expertise is actually in that, the pharmaceutical uh, company's hands. So the solution for that has been to, st to st stimulate public-private partnerships. PPPs, if you will, and these public-private partnerships put together people like me in the university with pharmaceutical companies to try and find new ways to get drugs. And the, one of the organizations that's largely uh, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation is the Medicines for Malaria Venture. It's a nonprofit organization that puts together pharmaceutical companies to develop and deliver new and affordable anti-malarial drugs. And they've supported a lot of our work here at the University of Washington. One of the ways, one of the tricks that we use uh, to find new drug targets, and this is being done by Michael Gelb, who's here in the audience, and Christopher Lind, and Fred Buckner, uh, and myself, and uh, uh, Erkang Fon, is to uh, use a, a, a term we call piggybacking. That is, like the uh, shuttle piggybacking on this airliner, we piggyback on all the work of the pharmaceutical companies. The idea is that it's really hard to find a drug completely from scratch. So we look for promising drug targets where a lot of development actually has been done. And then we see if these existing drugs or things that are close to drugs show promise against malaria, thus piggybacking onto the efforts of the pharmaceutical company. And one example I'll talk about is uh, this almost unpronounceable enzyme which uh, uh, Professor Gelb found called protein pharmacell transferase. And uh, actually it rolls off my tongue, but it probably won't yours. But it's an enzyme, just suffice to say, that modifies proteins and it's really important for, for cells to divide. And it's actually, because it's an interesting target, uh, necessary part of cells to divide, it's actually a target for cancer therapy. And it's made it all the way into now late stage clinical development, clinical trials for cancer therapy. But the cool thing about this for, for an infectious disease geek like me is that these inhibitors that they developed for cancer actually kill malaria. And uh, we've been able to go on to show that in a mouse model malaria, it kills the malaria and actually cures the mice from, uh, from malaria. And this shows you a normal looking malaria cell and then a malaria cell after it's been treated with one of these drugs that the drug industry has taken along. Now, it's, we're not quite getting a free ride from this because we are having to do some work. And uh, Professor Gelb and his colleagues in chemistry are working hard on trying to make these compounds stick around long enough in the blood, blood so that they'll actually kill uh, malaria in humans. 
and we have a little ways to go, but this is an example of how piggybacking onto the work of a pharmaceutical company has actually helped us a long way to find something practical. Now, let me go on to talk about uh, uh, vaccines. And first thing you need to understand a little bit about is malaria immunity. So I already told you about how that little child going from the, the basically one to five-year-old starts acquiring more and more immune uh, uh, effectors, immune response to malaria parasites over those five years. And over those five years, they become immune to those sporozoites that are injected by the malaria mosquito, and they become immune to all these different antigens, the outside proteins on cells that, uh, uh, that the, the malaria parasite has literally hundreds of them. But because of the, the complexities here, there's been many failures in, in vaccine development. And once we figured out how intricate the genome is and how good it is at escaping the immune response, it, it told us what are better targets and so on. So there are a few now promising malaria vaccines that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. The RTSS vaccine, which is already into late stage clinical trials, uh, the idea that one could use actually live sporozoites uh, for vaccinating people. and uh, uh, a, a special pregnancy vaccine that's being developed. So the RTSS is a fancy vaccine where they've taken the surface proteins off of these sporozoites. Actually, they grow it in a bacterium called E. coli that we use as a workhorse. And they, they put that into a virus-like particle, so into a big lump of the protein. And then they mix it with an immunostimulant, so it'll stimulate the immune system, a special immunostimulant, even with all of this technology, it requires three injections at monthly intervals. So it's difficult to deliver. But there, has been, there have been now uh, at least five different clinical trials with this. And the clinical trials suggest that you can get lasting immunity after these three injections. And there's been up to a 50% reduction in severe malaria in kids uh, shown now with this intervention. So, uh, uh, the GlaxoSmithKline, which is, has done a lot of development of this vaccine, actually originally came out of academia, then moved into GlaxoSmithKline, uh, is, is taking it forward with big help from the Gates Foundation and the Malaria Vaccine Initiative uh, to look at it further. So I mentioned this, this idea of giving live sporozoites. So there actually, uh, quite a while ago, the uh, uh, Ruth and Victor Nusenzweig uh, found that if you irradiate sporozoites, so you irradiate those little tubular things that come out of, of mosquitoes, actually the easier way to do it is you just irradiate the mosquitoes and the sporozoites are in the mosquitoes. Then you have it bite volunteers and you give them multiple doses. So these little red lines are every time, this is time, and every time here you see here, someone's exposed to hundreds of mosquitoes and they bite in this little, through this little chamber. Uh, so it's not the most pleasant thing, right? You have to have about 1,000 mosquito bites. That sounds like you die of itchiness, right? But, but anyway, the cool thing is that when you challenge people with live malaria after that, using mosquitoes that aren't irradiated, all of the people that didn't get that get infected. And over 90% of people that got that treatment are resistant. So, Actually, this fellow uh, shown here has formed a company called Scenaria, and Scenaria is now trying to, to ramp up this effect to actually produce uh, uh, sporozoites, maybe in some kind of freeze-dried form or something irradiated that can be delivered to the developing world. And uh, they, they actually think that they can do this with about 50 technicians' effort and dissecting mosquitoes to get the salivary glands like you guys were doing outside. So one cool trick, though, that's, that's uh, actually been promulgated here in Seattle uh, at the Seattle Biomedical Research Institute uh, just down in the South Lake Union area uh, is something that was found by Stefan Kappa. And uh, Stefan Kappa employed the mouse model of malaria. You know how I told you there was lizard malaria and mouse malaria and so on. And they f he found, looking at the genome, genes that are really important for sporozoites to make it through the liver 
and come out on the other side and infect red blood cells. And uh, what he found is if he, if he knocked out these genes, so if he put in a piece of DNA in the middle of those genes and made them unable to express the proteins they're supposed to express, then when uh, he took those sporozoites and gave them to mice repeatedly, they arrested in the liver stage, didn't reach the blood stage, so that was very similar to what was happening with the irradiated sporozoites. And then mice that were uh, uh, got those genetically altered sporozoites, if it were, were 100% resistant to challenge. So basically, they uh, 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 were completely protected from malaria. And so he now has Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding to create and has created strains of human malaria with these homologous genes. Those are the same genes that they found in the mouse malaria, knocked out in the human strains. And they're going to give it to human volunteers very soon uh, in uh, trials that will be conducted uh, partly here at, at the University of Washington Hospital uh, in a method shown uh, uh, roughly here. The, the, the last thing I want to talk to you about that's coming wrong in malaria, I mentioned this problem where uh, this is pregnant, women that are pregnant one time, women that are pregnant two times, and women that are pregnant more than two times. And they found that women that are pregnant one time have a much higher rate of pregnancy-associated malaria than those that have been uh, pregnant multiple times. And in fact, the, not only the rate, but the severity shown as the number of parasites uh, in their placenta is much worse the first time around. Uh, these studies were conducted by uh, Patrick Duffy and uh, Mikhail Fried. And uh, they went on then to show that what was happening was a special uh, thing on placental cells was showing up that isn't seen in the bloodstream at any other time, time of uh, human development. And this is chondroitin sulfate A, and it turns out that parasites get selected during that pregnancy that will bind chondroitin sulfate A, end up gumming up the inside of the placenta and causing a placenta malaria. The cool thing is that there's only one or two or maybe three variants of this around the world that will actually cause this kind of pregnancy-associated malaria. And uh, women become naturally resistant as they acquire the immune response to these, to these uh, chondroitin sulfate A binding things. And so that's why women become more resistant to malaria in their second and third pregnancies is that they've already started to develop an immune response to these special malaria parasites that show up in the first pregnancy. So and the cool thing also is these anti-adhesion antibodies can be taken out of one woman in Thailand and given to another woman in Kenya and she's protected. So there's, there's a good model there that one can make a vaccine for this. So what Patrick Duffy and his co-workers with Bill and Melinda Gates support are doing is narrowing down from a huge number of genes, over 6,000 genes in the malaria genome, to several now that are lead candidates that the women actually are protected as they go into their second and third uh, uh, pregnancy. These are parasite genes. They've been able to break them down into smaller and smaller subunits, show that they actually block the sticking to placental cells, and they're going forward now to, to uh, do early clinical trials to look at whether they can generate protective immune responses to protect women. So the idea is you can immunize children around when, women in particular, when they're around 10 years old, then when they get pregnant the first time, they won't have very much risk from malaria at all. So just to summarize where I've been tonight, uh, I've told you about the advances in malaria that have been helped a lot by the new genome of malaria and our understanding, better understanding for why malaria causes disease, that is pathogenesis, why it persists in the humans, uh, what kind of prevention has been devised, and particularly the, the effective role of insecticide-treated uh, bed nets, I talked about drug development, and one thing that's good and is out there uh, at the end of the road now is this artemisinin combination therapy. But we need to continue to develop new therapies because it always seems like the malaria parasite is able to come, become resistant to anything we develop. 
And then at the same time, we need to, to push on and develop new vaccine therapies and to roll out all of these different therapies at the same time uh, to help bring the promise that Melinda Gates brought to us at that conference last year, that is to eradicate malaria. Thank you very much for your attention.